young Earth creationism is precluded entirely by dozens upon dozens of well-known facts of the natural world. From the radioactive decay law, the speed of light, and the nature of the geologic column, to the statistics that surround common ancestry, the fossil record, and our genetic relationship to the rest of the primates, mammals, and really just the entire tree of life. But so frequently I encounter what I am calling bite-size busts, aspects of STEM fields that entirely preclude young earth creationism that aren't typically talked about, but bust hard nevertheless. Be it geology, anthropology, astronomy, or physics, here we discuss the minutia of fields that leave young earth creationism out in the cold. If you're new to the channel, don't forget to subscribe if you like this kind of content, leave a like and maybe a comment, and if you feel like supporting the channel in other ways, you can check out my Patreon, my PayPal, or stores. Today we are discussing how impact events manage to entirely preclude young earth creationism by blasting it to kingdom come. But before we talk about how problematic simple space debris is for this particular pseudoscience, let's discuss a little bit of background, including what we know about impact events and how we know it. Impact events refer to the collision of any two astronomical bodies. In the context of this video, this is a reference to the impact of asteroids, meteoroids, and comets into planets. Yes, planets, not just Earth. You'll see what I mean later. The history of our planet and its relationship with impact events is as enthralling as it is explosive. Not only do these collisions leave enormous records in the rocks geochemically, but each time a massive object slams into the surface of the Earth, biodiversity effectively gets a soft reset, which is of course also recorded in the fossil record. The most famous impact mass extinction is of course the KPG, which wiped out the non-avian dinosaurs some 65 million years ago. But impact events aren't rare, which is admittedly very scary. Our planet is constantly peppered with meteoroids. Over 25 million every day will burn up in our atmosphere as meteors and make for some very pretty shooting stars. But each year, around 500 will survive the heat and slam into the ground, making them meteorites. Of these 500, approximately one will be greater than 4 meters or 13 feet in diameter, and has the strength of a mild nuclear weapon. These numbers are based on yearly observation by the Earth Impact Effects Program, thanks to the use of radar as well as meteorite recovery. By combining our known historical records, which go back several thousand years or so, as well as the existing known craters, astrogeologists have managed to roughly estimate the frequency of impacts of pretty much every given size. And it is, of course, very alarming. 20 meter or 66 foot long asteroids or meteoroids slam into the Earth around twice a century with the power of over 30 Hiroshima blasts. The 2013 Chelyabinsk Superbolide is one such example, clocked at 26 to 33 Hiroshimas and appearing to panicking Russians as brighter than the sun in the sky. In 1908, the Tunguska event was around three times this strength and leveled 80 million trees. You may be wondering, why don't we take cover more often if these larger impacts are indeed so frequent? And the reason is twofold. The first is that the majority of these meteors tend to burn up in the atmosphere. And the second is that the ones that don't typically end up landing in the ocean, leaving the only witnesses radar and a lot of fish. Ancient impact events can be identified by their geological features and chemical signals. For instance, while some creationists would like to shrug off impact events as simply local volcanism, volcanism fails to provide the impact-specific signatures such as shocked quartz, enormous concentrations of iridium, gravity anomalies, and tektites. Of course, the most famous and well-studied impact is the one that snuffed out the non-avian dinosaurs and left the 110-mile-wide Chicxulub crater. This impact event, which will be covered more in depth in my next mass extinction video, triggered 100 meter tall or 330 foot tall mega tsunamis which reached every coast on the planet, as well as magnitude 9 earthquakes felt across the globe and widespread volcanism. The high end estimation of energy released is equivalent to 921 billion Hiroshima A-bombs. 
Based on crater formation determined by the Earth's closest celestial partner, the Moon, astrogeologists have determined that during the last 600 million years, the Earth has been struck by at least 60 objects of a diameter of 5 kilometers, 3 miles, or more. The smallest of these impactors would have left a crater almost 100 kilometers or 60 miles across, so Chicxulub is but a moderate event in the sordid history of our planet's impact experience. So are you perhaps beginning to see the severity of our problem? As we all know, young Earth creationism requires a spontaneous creation event some 6,000 years ago, as well as a global flood event some 4,400 years ago that is responsible for all layers of the geologic column from the Cambrian to the Cretaceous, as well as their fossils, every impact event or mass extinction signature within said layers, the current positioning of the continents, the state of decay of all radioactive elements, and finally, the various levels of diversity for all extant life. Naturally, today we're honing in on the impact event problem. This is because young Earth creationists have to cram 4.5 to 4.8 billion years of impact events into one half of a single year. This is because they suppose the entire geologic column was formed during this half-year-long flood event, and we find all of these craters strewn throughout the entire geologic column. Now, we know of around 50 craters that are larger than 8 kilometers or 5 miles in diameter. My physicist friend Dakota helped me run some math using the Chicxulub condition scaled up, which may be familiar to those who watched my video on the Young Earth Creationist Hydroplate Hypothesis. The heat alone from the top 40 of these impact events would just about boil the oceans. This doesn't even touch the associated mega tsunamis, earthquakes, and volcanism. Needless to say, this makes the global flood a physical impossibility outright, since we are only considering the top 40 known impact events, let alone the hundreds of millions of other impacts throughout the history of our planet. But Earth isn't the only planet that experiences impact events. Young Earth creationists must also come up with an explanation for why all of the rocky planets in our solar system are pockmarked with craters, hundreds of millions of them, in such a short time frame. And they got 6,000 years. In conventional science, observed craters are in line with known impact frequencies for given planets. Outside of the late heavy bombardment period when the planets were still forming and the debris of our solar system was raining down on these newly formed worlds, we do not see periods of intense repeated impacts on the scale of Chicxulub and larger, which is what is required to explain even a fraction of the cratering we see on a time scale of around 6,000 years. So naturally, creationists have scrambled to propose various explanations, and very similar to the flood models, they tend to come in one of two categories. The first is the pretty tame ideas of Answers in Genesis, ICR, and Creation.com, and the second is going to be the straight bonkers, crazy stylings of Young Earth Creationist Outcast and Hydroplate proponent, Walt Brown. The former group has a few different ideas. Danny Faulkner of Answers in Genesis proposes that most cratering of non-Earth planets took place on day four of the creation week, and that there was probably some kind of secondary cratering during the flood. Michael Ward at Creation.com disagrees, instead proposing that a massive bombardment may have actually initiated the flood. Ward, to his credit, does note that energy may be an issue with this proposal. Walt Brown, on the other hand, proposes that all impact events in the solar system, or at least the vast majority, was caused by Earth ejecta that was jettisoned to the stars when the fountains of the Great Deep broke open. He suggests that all our craters, as well as those on the Moon and Mars, must come from Earth rock. <laughs> that is without a doubt the dumbest thing I've ever heard. You are a f***ing <laughs> idiot. One absolutely damning problem with proposing that impact events are the result of expelled debris from Earth during a global flood has to do with simple mass. 
The mass required to explain the cratering observed in our solar system was roughly calculated by physicist Jellison and is well over 100 times the mass of our planet. So the debris that caused the cratering definitively did not come from here. And these are really going to be the only attempts that we see by the pros. There just isn't really that much out there by them with regard to explaining the cratering of the Earth or pretty much any other rocky body in our solar system other than the moon. Of course, amateur creationists take a different approach entirely. They propose that most of the craters we see here on Earth aren't actually craters at all, and instead are caused by volcanism or some other low-energy Earth event. Usually, this comes in the form of insisting that the calling cards of impact events are seen in some volcanic eruptions, such as shatter cones or tektites. This betrays not only a pitiful understanding of the massively complicated suite of analyses that goes into determining whether a crater is indeed an impact crater, but also belies a frankly insulting opinion of scientists who work on them, as if it were as simple as finding one or two characteristics, checking off the impact crater box, and calling it a day. The Earth Impact database has a layman page on how potential impact craters are assessed, and it even has a short summary that details how many geochemical and morphometric signatures go into declaring a site as an impact zone. So now let's get into some of the principal criteria for determining whether or not a geologic feature is indeed an impact structure formed by some kind of hypervelocity impact event like an asteroid or a meteor. These criteria can generally be divided into three categories, the first of which is the megascopic view, which is bird's eye, so you can see the entirety of the crater. Then there is the macroscopic, which is kind of up close and personal, what you can do standing and picking up and looking at rocks. And then of course there is the microscopic, which is looking at the uh, tiny minutia of these geologic structures, as well as some of the geochemistry. As we go through this criteria, really ruminate on the nature of this process. And after the video, consider consuming some young earth creationist literature and see for yourself how surface level their assessments really are concerning any kind of geologic structure. The first telltale sign of an impact crater is the presence of shatter cones that are found in situ or at the site. This is considered to be macroscopic evidence. Number two is the presence of multiple planar deformation features, or PDFs, in minerals within in situ lithologies. This is considered to be microscopic evidence. Number three is the presence of high pressure mineral polymorphs within these in situ lithologies. This is microscopic evidence as well and requires proof via X-ray diffraction. Number four is morphometry. On other planetary bodies, such as the Moon or Mars, we rely on the shape of the impact structure in order to determine its type, such as simple versus complex. This can really be done with any type of rocky planet. It's a megascopic quality, as in it's too big to typically be seen unaided by the human eye and requires remote sensing, aerial photography, and detailed mapping of multiple outcrops in order to assemble and view the typically kilometer or multiple kilometer size structure. On Earth, recognizing impact structures solely by their morphometry is confounded by two general factors. The first is just typical geologic processes such as weathering, erosion, burial processes, and tectonic deformation can obscure or destroy the original shape of the impact crater. The second is that certain terrestrial features generated by means other than impact events can have comparable circular forms, such as volcanoes, salt diapirs, and glacigenic features. This means that circular structure alone is not sufficient to claim impact structure status. In fact, some buried craters have been revealed solely by geophysical techniques, although drill cores are typically required to reveal macro and microscopic evidence to prove an impact origin. Number five is the presence of an impact melt sheet and or dikes, as well as impact melt breccias that were generated due to a hypervelocity impact. This is considered to be macroscopic evidence. Essentially, we may find chunks of rock that were so superheated they melted together, but no evidence that this was due to the mantle. Other than the mantle, only a high velocity event could cause the rock to be heated to such high temperatures. Such melts may also be contaminated by meteoric projectile components, which can then be determined by specialized geochemical analysis. 
Melt sheets may be overlain by so-called fallback breccias, and material blasted out of the crater may form ejecta blankets about the original central cavity. For large impact events, ejecta may be distributed globally. Impact melt sheets are recognized by careful mapping and rock sampling, followed by microscopy and geochemical analysis. Number six is the presence of pseudotacolite and breccias. Pseudotacolite is a rock type that is generated by faulting at either the microscopic or macroscopic scale. Now, pseudotacolites are also associated with seismic faulting, such as those found in earthquakes, so they are not exclusively impact generated. But in association with features listed previously, they can be considered to be a contributory criterion. Not mentioned in this list, but also considered by many to be highly diagnostic, is the presence of massive amounts of the element iridium. This element is found only rarely on Earth, but in high abundance in asteroids, meteoroids, and comets. Interestingly enough, we find a global band of iridium that caps off the last geologic strata with dinosaurs in it, and it's dated to the same time frame as the Chicxulub crater. Another diagnostic tool is the presence of tektites, which are gravel-sized bodies composed of black, green, brown, or gray natural glass formed by the terrestrial debris ejected during meteorite impacts. Tektites also have telltale characterization. They have fairly homogeneous composition, are extremely low in their water content as well as other volatiles, they have an abundance of lecatellarite, and a general lack of microscopic crystals known as microlites as well as a chemical relation to the local bedrock or local sediments. Their distribution also exists geographically within extensive strewn fields. In terms of relative importance, it's generally considered that criteria 1 through 3 are definitive, as in they relate to the passage of a shockwave through rock and resulting modification processes, with the contributory evidence being added by 4 through 6. For buried structures that cannot be directly assessed but are well preserved, as revealed by detailed geophysical techniques, some workers consider this to be strong evidence in favor of an impact origin. Normally, buried craters are verified by drilling and sampling the material directly for evaluation using criteria 1 through 3. These principles are applied to some 50 massive craters on our planet, craters which suggest impacts that collectively boil the seas of the Earth should they occur during a half-year time frame. This is a very straightforward physical process, and its problematic nature is underscored by the deficit of young Earth creationist coverage on it. They don't tackle it because they can't tackle it. So it seems indeed that impact events have precluded young earth creationism. Responses to this bust will almost certainly be wild references to papers that supposedly show that volcanism can mimic certain aspects of impact events. Of course, these particular claims will almost certainly fail to address how modern geology can indeed differentiate between, say, a volcanically formed tektite versus an impact event tektite. And of course, there will probably be a lot of, a lot of foot stomping about the unanswered questions behind abiogenesis. But like the heat problem to which impact events contribute, there is simply no way to physically or mechanically fit in all these impact events and collisions into a 6,000 year time frame, which is why you'll never hear it sufficiently addressed. And so, my gentle and modern apes, please join me next time for another bite-sized bust to some big pseudoscience. Two to the one, one to the three. I like good pussy and I like good trees. Smoke so much weed you wouldn't believe. And I get more ass than a toilet seat. Three to the one, one to the three. I met a bad bitch last night in the D. Let me tell you how I made her leave with me. Conversation and Hennessy. I've been to the mother. Heard motherfuckers talk, seen them drop If I ain't got a weapon, I'ma pick up a rock And when I bust your ass, I'm gonna continue to rock Get your ass on the wall with your two left feet It's real easy, just follow the beat Don't let that 